So, uh, welcome everybody to uh, tonight's uh, IEEE Computer Society meeting. Our topic is ransomware impact and state in 2021. Um, I'm Darren Johnson. I'm one of the Computer Society uh, Ray Ventura officers. And um, a couple of housekeeping things before we begin. First off, uh, we do have a couple of other uh, events coming up, uh, uh, online events. Uh, a week from today on the 21st, uh, we have a talk about electric, uh, electric vehicles. Um, and also, uh, not till October 9th, but we do have a STEM event. Uh, in particular, it's a STEM event to try and encourage uh, more girls to get involved in STEM activities. Um, the planning for that, however, is going on now, so we are looking for volunteers. Uh, the, Information for both of those events are on our website, and if you signed up and if you um, said to uh, send you uh, emails, uh, you'll get uh, you'll start getting weekly notices about our events. Uh, one other logistical thing is um, if you have any questions, uh, you can type them in the Q and A box, um, and we will uh, we'll be taking care of those. Uh, if it asks you for which uh, person to send it to, just go ahead and pick all panelists, and uh, I'll be triaging those. So if it's a if it's a logistical question, I'll answer it. If it's a question for our speaker, um, well, I'll I'll be reading those to him. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dhruv Pandya is an information security specialist at a leading market research firm. He holds a master's degree in computer science and bachelor of engineering in computer engineering. His master's thesis included a research contribution to the SoCal High Technology Task Force. As a computer engineer and evolving computer scientist, Drew has a strong background in information security governments, digital forensics, vulnerability management, risk management, and cryptography. And I think this is your second or third talk to our group over the past few years. So. Thank you so much. Take it away. Oh, thank you, Darren, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight uh, on this presentation. Uh, the subject itself is a little bit um, tricky in the way where we are trying to discuss something which has super technical nature, but with the recent developments around uh, media working from home, and, and, and a lot of news articles, it has just become a common topic that we read every day. So I've tried to keep the balance between both the worlds and, and, and navigate through the whole uh, subject and see how we can show the effect and statistics of what exactly ransomware is doing to us right now as a global society. Uh, with that, to the next slide. As I said, we'll go through the definition of ransomware, types of ransomware, uh, a brief timeline on how we see the major ransomware incidents. Pretty interesting, just as an FYI. Um, some some statistics that I I like to mention. It's a great research done by a security firm called Sophos that that was done in 2021. Super informative, but that was done before the recent ransomwares on uh, Kaseya and uh, Guess hit. So. We, we don't have that info yet. And then I've mentioned some recent ransomware attacks and some tips around how to mitigate and uh, do a quick incident response on the ransomwares. So with that, uh, simply ransomware is a, is a malware. Uh, the goal is to just disrupt your day-to-day uh, -day work. Uh, and that's exactly what a malware does. Uh, in depth, there are multiple ways to break into your system through back doors, Trojan horses, and 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 like completely render it unable to function. And that's exactly what a malware does. Ransomware is a notch above uh, on the malware, or I would say it's a special type of malware which does specifically two things. Um, it it just renders your system unable to function, and it encrypts your file. And, and these two functionalities overlap. And that's why there are two major types of ransomwares. Number one is crypto, and the other one is locker ransomware. Um, crypto ransomware is where, where you your systems or your data is already breached, 
and and the hacker is keeping an eye out on what is a critical type of data to your organization. They are not just looking for any files, but they are looking for the most critical infrastructure. And they focus on encrypting just those files and hold you to ransom. Pretty old method, uh, works in some cases and doesn't work in some cases. Locker ransomware is a, is a ransomware technique where your system is completely unable to function. You just have a screen that says, pay me the money and we'll go from there. And then they'll unlock the system, which actually uh, and locker locker ransomware are, are much more used in today's scenarios where the hackers are just not monitoring uh, which files are important to you, but instead of that, monitoring all your boot records, everything and certain iterations on your 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 way, the way you function, you boot your computer, turn it off, turn it on, your max the applications that you try to use, which can be infiltrated, and then then lock it. And, and completely render it uh, impossible for functioning. So do keep in mind those two type of ransomwares and we'll go through some of the 10 uh, well-known ransomware strains uh, that we have seen so far. I mean, there are multiple to be honest, but these are super well-known and, and they're kind of like grandfather ransomware schemes where uh, the current ransomwares just bank on these and just gets advanced. Uh, the one which I mentioned, the first one is Petya. Uh, Petya is is first observed in 2016 as and and thought of as to be have ties with the Russian army or the Russian intelligence um, and and this particular ransomware is is overwriting your master boot record and completely disabling your system so it doesn't let you function so if we go back to the last slide it's a lockware uh, then. Another variation that was observed was NotPetya. NotPetya was a, a, a wiper. And, and again, I mean, that was that was classified as a ransomware, but then the intelligence agencies and the more research that was done kind of brought it to a conclusion that this, this is a type of ransomware, but it is a malware. It, it cannot just be called a ransomware. And the reason is it's not just encrypting the data, it's just destroying the data uh, instead of obtaining a ransom. Um, another important one that I, I think is is affecting our day-to-day -day lives as a regular citizen is Ryuk. Um, Ryuk was first observed in 2018, uh, thought to be pretty neutral. It wasn't that active, but um, in 2020, all, pretty much all the attacks that we heard of on the hospital systems, mainly where there is a lot of uh, um, IoT devices or POS systems. Rook was one of the most responsible ransomware found, um, and and it it yielded a high ransom to the uh, hackers who were behind this whole operation. Um, and as I mentioned again, I mean, if you have a Microsoft system, and most of the corporations do, they disable the Windows Restore option, so you don't have to go back and write anything unless you completely rewrite your machine and uh, reimage the whole thing. Uh, a very famous name, WannaCry. Uh, WannaCry was uh, 2017, introduced in 2017, still functional. Uh, 150 countries were affected by it. Um, it is said that it, it it goes from the NSA, or the origination is from NSA, which is a much different perspective than the Russian side of stuff or Chinese side of stuff. Uh, and um, that created a big uh, global outage of ransomware from an average citizen to the organizations. WannaCry affected almost 2,300 computers globally uh, in 2017, which is uh, which is 230,000 computers. Sorry, which is pretty uh, significant if you look at it. Uh, there is similarly there is bad rabbit crypto locker. Uh, the one that I would love to mention is. Uh, GoldenEye, uh, the name goes back to the Bond movie, GoldenEye. Uh, it, it is actually a, a patent of uh, the Pechia uh, ransomware that was discussed in 2016. Um, easily used by uh, the ransomware as a service people to send us a phishing link and, and, and then infect the machine. Uh, the biggest highlight of the whole uh, event in 2018 or 2017 when GoldenEye was discovered was that it actually triggered off the radiation level alarms at Chernobyl's nuclear plant. 
Um, so it's just one of those things where um, it was very difficult uh, to kind of control it, identify it, and then mitigate the issue. Uh, another fun one is Jigsaw. Uh, Jigsaw goes back to the Saw movie franchise where uh, it is it is the fear or it is the anxiety of a victim which names this ransomware where the hackers gradually deletes all the files given the time if the ransom is not paid. Um, so those are some of the ransomware strains which I think is much more uh, highlighted in all of the recent attacks, but they were they were not newly invented ones. They were just modification of the one that were seen back in 2015 and 2016. Uh, this is a very simple timeline, I would say, uh, that I was able to trace down and, and kind of get together with the topic, uh, where the first Trojanware, uh, fr first ransomware was discovered in 18, uh, 1989. Uh, as an AIDS Trojan, um, simple concept, um, a, a guy named Joseph Pop who actually handed out 20,000 infected discs in a World Health Organization's AIDS conference. Um, and this is actual screenshot from that ransomware um, where the program would count the number of times um, the, the machine was booted. And once it would reach 90, it would hide the directories and encrypt the lock uh, encrypt or log the names on the C drive, which was pretty bad because people were still learning how to use computers at that point in time uh, on a normal life and in the industries. And, and this was something they couldn't know uh, what to do about. And nothing that was infected through networks, it was more like through the external storage devices. Uh, to regain the access, you just would have to send $189 to a Panama-based organization, which was called Cyborg Corporation. Um, it is called to be, it is it is known to be the grandfather of all ransomwares, just because the guy asked for ransom for unlocking the files, and and he he was able to uh, provide the files publicly, uh, like decryption keys publicly to unencrypt the files. Uh, but as you see, as, as time goes by, we, we see the progress into multiple OSs. And, and the reason I'm, I'm uh, much more inclined to mention the OSs in this particular uh, image is because uh, in the industry, we do have this perspective that Linux is much more secure or Mac is much more secure than the Windows environment. True, but it's not immune to a attack or a Trojan horse or a ransomware. So um just to mention that part um uh, i wanted to spin some names which is uh, which are ransom as a service providers so in a in a modern world nobody has to gain an expertise on how to uh, launch a ransomware attack if you have some bitcoins available and you want to hire some hacker there is a lot of uh, black market available uh, where you can hire somebody for ransomware as a service where the hacker would launch a ransomware on certain organization or an individual on your behalf and and the spoils would be uh, separated it's a it's the same mafia rule uh, just in a more advanced way i i would certainly encourage to look at the name uh, r evil uh, which is one of the most notorious uh, organizations uh, behind a lot of attacks. Um, and there's one more called uh, Darkside, but Darkside is, is it, it's not attacking a certain group, it's random, it's more random. But these are like super targeted attacks, at least from our evil. Awesome. Let's jump into the statistics of um, what actually how do we see the increase in ransomware uh, over the years as an industry? So this is one of the uh, government researches that, that is identifying in United States and worldwide uh, from 2014 to 2020, the, the millions of ransomware attacks recorded by the law enforcement agencies. And as you can see, and from our previous conversations on most of the ransomware detections, right? 2016 was like a revolutionary time for ransomwares to exist, like Pechia, non-Pechia, Golden Eye. All of these ransomwares were like just created. 
Um, there was no known defense except just pay the ransom. And and it was just a bad situation where where people did not actually know how to how to move on, how to uh, restore the systems back. I mean, there was some estimation, but again, there was no strategy. Uh, I wouldn't say we still have a strategy, but yes, there are some known steps that we can use as a prescriptive method to protect ourselves from ransomware. As you can see, uh, it did go down in um, 2017, 2018, 2019, but again, we see the rise in 2020 and 2021. Uh, 2020, we have 304 million ransomware attacks globally, which is pretty significant because it was obvious that we were not prepared to go and work from home. Uh, we were Our practices were not appropriate, uh, were not up to date. Um, there was going to be a lag in patching, uh, IT teams trying to figure out how exactly we need to make sure that our systems are up to date from a security perspective. There was a lot of VPN dependability, a uh, lot of more RDP access that people had to give to the developers. And, and it was just a crazy time in 2020 when everybody had to go back. So we see a, we, we see a rise in the ransomware attacks just during that time. And, and bear in mind, I mean, 2016, we had some significant attacks, but those were like more money oriented, finance oriented. In 2020, we, we saw a lot of attacks which were state sponsored politically motivated to disrupt major infrastructure, to disrupt hospitals. And, and the effect of those ransomwares were pretty significant to an average citizen. So we'll, we'll go over those statistics in a while. Um, and this is the research I was talking about in the beginning of the talk, where, where the, the company SoForce uh, hired a good research house to do a survey on 5400 IT making IT decision makers across uh, 30 countries which are which are now part of that major IT global family right and um, they wanted to check and see how the IT decision maker feels about it and and not every company has to have a security person or a CIO even in that case so it's it's a, it's a very nicely used term IT decision makers. Um, we had 37% of the respondents confirm in 2021 that they were hit by a ransomware. So we are still what in July of 2021 and there are at least uh, out of 5,400, 37% said that yes, they were, uh, they, they, they were part of the ransomware over this year and the last year. Um, and 54% had their files encrypted over the last year, and it was considered to be a most significant attack. Now, most significant attack means, yes, there was a whole financial implication, uh, data implication, and then there was some more damage, which constitutes as a most significant attack. Uh, I would put the solar winds hack in one of those categories from 2020, the fire eye and the solar winds hack. 96% um, of those data was encrypted. Uh, got their data back in the most significant ransomware attack. Now that's a tricky analysis because 96% of those data was given back through multiple ways. So like they did do uh, data restoration or they paid the ransom. There's a lot of stuff there and, and not everybody was upright and wanted to say what exactly happened. Uh, average mid-sized organi mid organization paid 170,000 as a, a US dollars as a ransomware amount. And and think about the local currency conversion, right? So if if I would and, and if I would just bring the currency conversion from India, uh, right now US dollar is what 74 times stronger. So multiply uh, this particular amount by 74 and that's how much the people in India paid. So it's a pretty big amount and, and significant amount. Uh, and, and they said 65% encrypted data was restored after the ransom paid. So not everybody got 100% data paid. Um, some people didn't get the data back. And I'll go over on how, how the perspective is different in the thug world, which I would say there, where you have ransom as a service people, and then you have a, uh, any regular hacker who is trying to do or portray or, or try to 
stage a ransomware attack. So an average bill for rectifying the ransomware attack uh, attack was somewhere between one point eight five million dollars U.S. dollars, and I, I don't. I don't blame them because you have to hire a security firm if you don't have the expertise to kind of try to gauge exactly how big is this incident, mitigate it, add resources, um, add if you don't already have, add some more uh, peri perimeter security. So it's not an easy thing and, and it, it is a very tough time. And, and again, uh, revenue loss is also one of the biggest thing, right? Now your, your company's brand name is on a line. So how to get back the trust. So there is a significant investment uh, done by the company. So uh, there are a couple of questions here that, that are kind of relevant to the, the, the slide. So um, if you don't mind, sure. I'll go ahead and ask, ask them now. Um, Absolutely. Uh, are the stats, I think this might have been this slide or the last slide, uh, based on acknowledged attacks or on total attacks? Uh, I would think with WFH in 2020 that the number would be much higher. Um, it, it is not acknowledged. It's more reported and 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 investigated by the law enforcement agency. So uh, okay. So yeah. the because the total attacks are kind of unknown, right? It's just the ones that are. And yeah, and that's the that's the tricky about. part. Yeah, yeah, and and we we are not even again we are not talking about lower number, right? We are talking about three hundred and four million attacks. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, it's it's it is, but yes, there is no no exact number because uh, and we'll go over the ethical dilemma of a lot of corporate firms who actually did not re report the ransomware. They just paid and moved on. They were like, this is not something we want to invest our time in. What did we learn? Mm -hmm. Add more backup and just move on. All right. So, yeah. And then another question, uh, also from Patrick, by the way. Uh, so uh, on your next slide. Uh, the last bullet seems to be disputed by the prior bullets. Are companies coming to the realization that they are not as well protected as they feel they are? Um, and he points out, you're you're not par paranoid if they really are out to get you. <laughs> yes, it's a loaded question. I know. Uh, it's agreed. Agreed. Um, depending upon who you talk to, right? So. Um, I would say 2020 and 2021 actually showed a mirror to a lot of the executives, uh, to a lot of uh, people who who thought that this couldn't happen to me. And and I'm I'm going back from major corporations, and we'll go over more slides where I'll, I'll show you exactly how big this is or how low this is. Right? Uh, for an example, a simple library in Colorado got. Uh, attacked by a ransomware because of their online catalog for the books, which was again, considering that was an old library, it was it was vulnerable. They exploited it, they they, they got all the payment details and everything. Uh, and they had to pay ransomware. They had to pay, uh, I would say at least $60,000 in Bitcoins to the ransomware, uh, to the company to, or the uh, attacker and, and get their data removed and now that small library has a silas uh, it's it's a really it's it's a very ethical dilemma right do you want to prepare before or after after is much more difficult and and that's why the, you see a lot of discrepancy because this subject is as such nobody wants to speak up Okay, and then, it. yeah, a uh, couple more qu questions uh, also regarding the slide. Um, do, do you know, does the average cost include the soft costs of reputational damage, loss of customers, et cetera? That's for Patrick. And mm -hmm. kind of sort of related from uh, Doug, do you know how many organizations in the U.S. paid into the average of $170,000? Uh, this is a mid-sized mid-sized organization. I I don't have the data actually to just boil it down to U.S. But I I can certainly research and get back to you. All right. Uh, this is a global data. Over thirty countries, we had this uh, survey done, and this was done by Sophos actually. So, yeah. Um. And and um, U.S. dollar being that global currency, that's why the cost was depicted in the U.S. dollars. All right, and then one more question on this slide. Um, 
It says uh, on average, uh, only 65% of uh, encrypted data was restored. Uh, can you mention any specific rent? ransomware attacks where the data was not restored even though the ransom was paid. Well that's why my that's where my comment around who the who the ransomware is from, right? So the major ransomware attacks that we know of are done by big uh, now like a corporation which are ransomware as a service. They, their main job is to do ransomware as a service. And they they do not risk uh, doing this kind of stuff because they they believe that the data has to be given 100%, otherwise it's bad for business. It's bad for their reputation. So if they don't give the data back, who is going to pay them next time? We are not going to get back the data anyways, so why would we pay? So the 65% is because of, so um, it is because of those individual hackers learning hackers, budding hackers who are trying to attack small organizations between 100 to 200 people. And one of those attacks I would say was like the library that I mentioned, uh, where they did not receive the complete data even after uh, giving the ransomware. But yeah, I can I can provide more details. When, when I'll finish the presentation and I'll, uh, when I think Darren, you, you shared the slides with uh, uh, on, this, on the site, right? Uh, yeah, I, 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 can, I can send that, I'll, I'll put them on our website and send them a link to, to them, so absolutely. Exactly, and then I'll, I'll mention all the links that, that is much more relatable to see if there is exact pinpointing on one of the ransomwares where the data wasn't free. But yes, if you if you go back to the types of ransomwares, uh, there's also like, as I mentioned, right, the jigsaw ransomware, where it's a time-bound ransomware. Should something happen, like you have, you have been given 24 hours and the more you wait on 24 hours, every hour there is the data which is being deleted. So a lot of statistics behind that too. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you for asking those questions. Yeah, and, and uh, the last point was, as I was mentioning earlier before the presentation started, was having the trained IT staff uh, or security staff is one of the most common reason that people see in the organizations being super confident that we're good. This is not going to happen to us. Um, as cheesy as it is, it's a reality in a lot of cases, and uh, it doesn't doesn't translate well when the ransomware hits. Okay, so a little bit brighter side here. Um, these are some of the countries that uh, were participant in the survey, and uh, if you can see. Uh, the organizations that are most hit by the ransomwares are the 1000 employees plus organizations right and the reason is there is a better chance of obtaining a higher ransom and these are these are carried out by the ransomware as a service or state sponsored attacks so this is exactly the reason why you see the, the type of attacks and then the amount that was paid for the mitigating the attack. And in some of the cases, we still don't have any diagnosis on exactly what is going on. Uh, for example, solar winds is one of those things where all we have is estimations. There is no clear uh, strategy on what exactly is going on in terms of the ransomware itself. Uh, the, the research actually lists out lists out the type of organizations that are being targeted right and and i i wanted to highlight this point and and the reason i'm highlighting it right now is it will translate to the next slides that i'm going to talk about which is the it technology and telecom sectors so what better than disrupting a telecommunication company in a country or just for ransom it creates a major panic uh, in a lot of ways a you have you have a critical infrastructure uh, related issue where you don't have any communications uh, at least the digital ones uh, there is a risk of major data leakages uh, any other chain ransomware attacks or chain malware attacks can propagate through these companies and and again it companies do trust each other so uh, being in security industry it's a it's a taboo to ask a security 
uh, software as a service on how do you develop your code? What is your application security? You know, people don't like it much, uh, but that's exactly what has been happening as a, as a pattern for the last two years where we see all the hackers need to do is just to get into this one major IT company or telecom company. And, and the disruption is just, just big. You, you have access to a lot of other companies just by accessing this one company. Financial services, of course, I, uh, I would say it is on number two uh, because it is it is easy money. You, you just disrupt encrypt the systems, lock them out. There is no other way than they have to pay the money for. And this is mostly, I would say, the banks, uh, which are not the major five banks, I would say, and because the major five have processes onto and then a very strong backup. So, yes, uh, education. A lot of schools got hit. In 2020 and 2021, school districts got hit by ransomwares. Uh, people gave anywhere from eBay gift cards to cryptocurrency to the hackers. Uh, the one that I'm most worried about myself is the healthcare, which is which which can actually disrupt a person's life, and and th there can be a loss of life, which is really bad because yes, in a lot of ways. So. Uh, and then infrastructure and all of that stuff. Oil and gas utilities are also on the top. Uh, so that, just just wanted to bring that idea because it gives a clear picture on what exactly people are targeting right now. Uh, same same stats, uh, but wanted to present it with this particular data where you see in 2020, there were, we were not prepared, right? So cyber criminals except like succeeded in encrypting the data. 73% of those responded had their data encrypted. So we were not at all prepared. We were relaxed. We thought this would work on learn as you go strategy. We'll, we'll see security is important or not. Uh, that amount decreased in 2021, but I wouldn't uh, get happy because it's just July 2021 and we have 54% cyber criminals succeeding in encrypting the data. Um, out of that, 24% uh, attacks were stopped before the data could be encrypted. Um, the companies who deploy a good perimeter security, seam solutions, uh, more EDR kind of solutions, they have much more visibility into their SOC, NOC operations. They know what is going on. There's a lot of good triaging going on and they can do that. Uh, Significant research about ransomware in the field on in, by the security companies actually jumped that number to 39%. And I, I hope to see this number even go better um, in 2021. So the encryption, the, the attack was stopped before it could encrypt the file. And then the the 3% and the 7% is data not encrypted, but the victim was still held to ransom. Uh, interesting category, which is, um, it, it does try to mention the fact about uh, the not Pechia kind of ransomware, which means we will just start deleting the files. So we are not encrypted, encrypting your files. This is a ransomware. Given the amount of time, we'll just start deleting your files. So they're not encrypting, they're just disrupting stuff. Um, more stats which is uh, which goes back to our conversation on the other slides where people are actually paying out the ransom because they don't have any option given a choice if you are running a company what is more important to you restoration of operations at the first priority or going into the analytics forensics trying to figure out what's going on uh, and then fight the ransomware because that's not going to happen if you don't have enough uh, preventive measures in place. And, and a very good example is the CEO of Colonial Pipeline. When he when he did the, his uh, uh, Senate hearing and the Congress hearing, he, he did accept it that yes, I did pay $4.4 million because to me it was getting back to business. Think about the Colonial Pipeline just sitting there with no uh, gas available to the employees, uh, actually blocking pretty much the entire East Coast. So what would you do? You would pay it off. Uh, but the good thing is 
federal agencies have ramped up their research and, and trying to identify the ways and the methods uh, that the ransomware is being paid. For example, cryptocurrency is one of those known untraceable currencies in a way, but the way you pay it is much more important and they're trying to get back to the hackers. And I'll, I'll give you an example on how, how serious of a war this is in a way. Uh, but federal government did recover two point something million dollars for this particular ransom that was given. Uh, so also the, the, the graph here is actually talking about how much ransom is being asked. So in the previous slide, we saw the companies getting attacked. So if you see oil and gas utility, there were only 197 companies uh, that were out of 5,400 people which reported a ransomware, right? In that, and, and there are significantly more, I wouldn't say there are less, but you see oil and gas utilities pay the maximum ransom. And this goes back with this 4.4 million number because A, they know they have money, the oil companies do have money and they want to get their business back to track. So usually that's the perception. Local government, again, the same thing, they know they have the money or they don't have the option not to pay the money and they will pay the money. Education, healthcare, similar. The least one is manufacture and production where you have a, a scope of probably getting away with it, but yet it's a, it's a less asked amount. Um, the stats were 26% and 32%. So 26% in 2020 uh, paid the ransom to get the data by, back. 2021, 32% folks paid the ransom. 56% um, in 2020 used their backups, 57 used their backup in 2021. Not a significant number, but we are just halfway through the year. I would I would see this number somewhere around 65 to 70% in 2021, and that's very aspirational. 12% um, and 8% other means to get the data back, which is going to the law enforcement, trying to replace the machine, uh, hindrance in operations, not a, not a good picture. And out of everything, 94% got their total data back and 2021, 96% got their total data back. Uh, some anomalies, but again, we are, we are in the middle of the year. So 2021 is more a mirror to what exactly is going on in the industry. Awesome. Uh, so so yes, uh, a couple questions about the, the stats, or at least one. Uh, back on slide 10, um, is uh, the, the organizers, organizations that were hit by ransomware or organizations that were surveyed? The organizations that were surveyed and uh, kind of admitted to, yes, there were ransomware attacks. <laughs> Good <point>. Yeah. <laughs> and um, do the forensics generally indicate any data exfiltration activity or is it just uh, local file locking going on? No, there is data exfiltration. And, and the, the, the way it happens is how do you hold somebody for ransomware? Again, there is, we'll leak your data kind of situation as well, right? Where um, uh, I was talking about uh, this slide where data not encrypted, but the victim still held to ransom. Got where we'll leak your data in 24 hours if you don't pay us money. And they, they actually back up the data in their own sites. Uh, our evil ransomware as a service has been notorious for doing that. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, that's all for right now. Okay, moving on to some interesting stuff. Ransom, ransomware attacks, which were pretty recent. Um, one of them was the state-sponsored attack. Uh, we all know the tension going on in the Middle East and potentially that affecting America. Uh, a certain uh, cybersecurity industry has always seen a lot of stuff from United States perspective. So when I would say that is, uh, there is not a lot of data available uh, globally, which can actually discuss the fact about how other countries are experiencing the threats. So it's like West world versus the East world, right? And, and that's kind of the issue that is going on here. And that's why you'll see a lot of threat actors are usually North Korea, Russia, uh, China, right? Because that's what United States perceives as a bigger threat 
and that's what you see and and that's where the research is done the most of the research uh, this one particular attack or this one particular type of ransomware is a state sponsored ransomware which was uh, um, investigated by a major cybersecurity firm flashpoint and and they actually said the islamic uh, revolutionary guards of iran uh, used the front company kind of to to start doing uh, this ransomware leaks like getting the data leaked and and just disrupting the systems in uh, israel so they were trying to to keep the ransom up for the israeli companies now in cybersecurity industries right now one of the major players in security research on iot devices and and general information security subject is israel so this was a pretty uh, this there was a pretty uh, sophisticated attack that was done which was called pay to key ransomware and it was literally just targeting the israeli companies and and they used the front to get the money back uh, Again, pretty cheesy names here. If you go through this, which were three documents were leaked by an anonymous entity named Read My Lips or uh, Loop Dog Hatton between March 2019 and April 1st, 2021. Um, Iran used the financial motivation as a cover. So it looks like, yeah, we are going to do the, uh, we, we are going to leak the data or we need money in this case. No, that wasn't the thing. They were actually getting some more uh, uh, classified information. the colonial pipeline attack the colonial pipeline attack was done by a ransomware as a service company called Darkside. pretty notorious uh, they don't have a significant pattern so they they go and tap into any industry so far uh, 24 hours before dark side actually attacked uh, the fashion giant guess and leaked a lot of personal information uh, we'll go on that one but um uh, the colonial pi pipeline attack was pretty significant because now this attack was on a major infrastructure uh, that us had and, and disrupting the gas supply for almost the entire east coast uh, it, it, it actually did send some chills into the spine of us government to get activated and say hey this is something pretty significant and and if it would have escalated this wouldn't have been good for a lot of people uh, but the the thing is I'll go through the timeline too, but like around around May uh, 7 to 13, between that timeline, uh, the CEO paid the 4.4 million ransom. And uh, uh, it was actually the panic that was spread among the people. So talking about the impacts of a ransomware, right? Uh, it was not just the data that was at stake, major systems were disabled, so lockware kind of situation. Uh, disabling major infrastructures, nothing can be done. So either they go back and re-up their entire infrastructure, which is not possible. It's just it's just panic, right? Even though you have a lot of stuff going on, you have a lot of security backups, everything. Your RTO and RPO, which is the recovery point, is very important. Business continuity matters the most, and that's why a robust business continuity is always expected. But in this case, even though you would have a major business continuity plan in place, it was too big to contain. And that's why the ransom was paid for $4.4 million. Um, still, research is going on. Uh, we have multiple advisories on how exactly uh, this particular ransomware hit, what exactly Darkseid did. Uh, when you get the PPT, I have... Uh, mentioned a great resource which shows the forensics on how they exploited the memories of the machine that were locked and uh, drive a great pattern a great amount of data on the behavioral aspects of a regular day-to-day -day employees uh, but yeah that's that's one of the most recent attacks uh, more famous one solar winds uh, this one actually started in 2020 uh, but on the verge of 2021, right? Where we see, and again, uh, the, this is still an ongoing investigation. So there is no confirmation on who did this attack. But again, the finger was pointed at Russia and uh, the virus was similar to NotPetya. NotPetya is, is very notorious for actually uh, deleting your files and, and, and making you uh, 
literally not capable to do anything more around this ransomware. So same thing. Um, I I did miss represent here. No no ransom no ransom is yet detected. I would say so. Not that four point four million. I think that was a mistake on my part. Um, but yeah, uh, SolarWinds was actually a major IT provider. So a lot of things. Uh, and again, please ignore this one. I I missed it completely. I, I can talk to it. So SolarWinds was a major IT service provider, and a lot of data uh, database uh, performance monitoring software, SolarWinds or IM, uh, and very well known and very well accepted company uh, in the in the IT businesses. So my point around why don't we evaluate and why don't we ask good questions to our own service providers, MSPs and the security tools providers uh, goes back to this particular attack where uh, started around December 8 where FireEye, the major Israeli company uh, for security analytics uh, and tools uh, came out and said, yes, our, our Red red team pen test tools were were hacked, and we don't know exactly what is going on, but we do think there is a uh, there is a Trojan backdoor, which was discovered and responsible for spreading the malware and actually uh, stealing our tools. And they named this particular malware as Sunburst. Uh, soon after that, December fourteen to seventeen, you see this. Uh, immediately zero day update from solar winds trying to tell their customers please upgrade their orion platform to remediate a uh, two point uh, like remediate a urgent security vulnerability or the critical security vulnerability they didn't come out right away and say hey we are affected by a but they didn't know at, at some point in time that yes this has happened again uh, the, the dilemma of saving the brand name versus the attack and then uh, the, this whole time you have Wall Street journals and other security researchers and newspapers kind of point by point revealing 200 customers, 300 customers on a daily basis on how many people got affected by the solar wind attacks. Uh, and that attack did go till the White House. So White House actually did have the same issues. And so almost all government companies were uh, and organizations were hit by that um, at a federal level which was pretty scary. And, and then there was, again, this was politicized because it was the election time and uh, China was the China was the first country pointed over the attack, but it wasn't the case. Uh, we have uh, in December 31st to January 29, now we are in 2020, Microsoft came out and says that yes, this related to the solar winds attack, uh, Russian hackers might have got our code, proprietary code. So that was one of the biggest discoveries. Again, that's why we see a lot of big names around this hack. Um, again, they asked, um, SolarWinds did publish, uh, now SolarWinds accepts that, yes, this was a hack and they published a whole advisory around the Sunburst and Supernova. Uh, a very recent development in 2021 was that Microsoft re reports a new wave of attacks by the Russian affiliated Nobelium gang, uh, now to the SolarWinds hack. So, they're still, they're, they're still trying to do the incident response as much as they can. Uh, also, the report stated that there was a possible DHS uh, cybersecurity leader emails compromised. So a lot of shaky things around this. There's a lot of Senate hearings going on, a lot of federal involvement in this particular hack because they are at stake at this point. The government is at stake too from, from a data perspective. It's just not a private company. So they can't just act like a cop. They have to be partners in this right now. And uh, as I said, today, the investigation is still going on. Super recent, the July ransomware attack, which actually, uh, this was a last minute addition to my presentation because I did not know this would happen. Uh, uh, week of July 4th, we were uh, made aware of the CIA. Um, I still remember the alerts coming in for me. Uh, is an intelligence alert around Casia ransomware, uh, which around uh, again is an IT company, IT security company, uh, providing a lot of uh, IT SM tools. Uh, the tool which got hacked was called Virtual System Administrator (VSA). Uh, the na name itself scares me, but hey, again, we live in the world of cloud and uh, virtual environments, so why not? Um, 
there were 35,000, almost 35,000 customers of Casilla, which were surveyed immediately to see if there was anything malicious. Of course, the research is still going on, but they confirmed 1,500 organizations, not named yet, uh, were actually part of the ransomware that was deployed. Uh, surprise, surprise, the company was let no, like made aware of a vulnerability onto their platform back in 2015. Uh, by another security firm and said, hey, you might want to patch it. Uh, just never happened. So actually the the exploit, a zero day exploit that was developed uh, by our Evo, which is the ransomware as a service company I mentioned earlier, uh, was based on this vulnerability that was never patched from 2015. Um, the, the current ask is 70 million. Of course, the number starts bigger, uh, but yes, there is a there's a negotiation still going on. And I think the government absolutely is intervening in this one as well. But if you have a Casilla software worth investigating more and uh, develop more uh, correlation queries in your scene tool. Uh, as I said in the recent news, just yesterday, uh, Guess announces the breach of their SSNs and employee SSNs and financial data. And this is just the first pass at what got hacked uh, by the by the ransomware as a service company called Darkside. Uh, as I mentioned, Darkside doesn't have a pattern where our evil had a pattern of just affecting the information security and information service management companies, IT management companies. Um, and then our evil uh, also yesterday was was reported that our evil disappeared from the internet. They are nowhere to be found, their websites or anything on the dark net as well. So that was one of the recent developments that I wanted to mention. Uh, and the, the the reason I think behind the or evil part is because the aggressive uh, chase by the government uh, based on the solar winds hack. Okay, so. A uh, what... couple questions regarding the recent attacks. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, was the solar winds more of a data scraping effort targeting the US government and not really a ransomware attack per se. Yes and no. Um, as I mentioned in my last slide, investigation is still going on, but um, it's hard to say. But the but the vectors do point that this was not just financial or data leakage. This was not just a financial motivation or motivation to disrupt the service. This was more than that. This was actually this this was actually to jeopardize the national security of the country. And again, we were in the election season, in the midst of the election season, which which can be one of the reasons. Uh, what we see is not just the federal government that is being affected by it. I, I mentioned it a couple of times. There is, uh, I, I didn't mention the name Intel here because Again, there's a lot of less data and ambiguity over what exactly happened to Intel. But Microsoft, yes, Microsoft has been a leader in this particular research where they have actually accepted that their, their, their codes were leaked, their, their emails were leaked, and proprietary code. So not to spin a conspiracy theory, but Microsoft at that point was a major defense, pro, defense IT service provider with the Jedi contract, and there was a lot of things going on. So there was there was definitely a, a separate motivation behind it, and that's exactly the reason why you have a lot of uh, federal investigations going on through state agencies and like the Congress and Senate and everything right now. And, and all the federal law enforcement agencies and the Office of the uh, Director of National Intelligence they're right on on this one. It's it's just they they're trying to collaborate with every research, security, independent research firm, nonprofits, uh, major research firms like Mitre and everybody to kind of identify what's going on. So, but yes, the answer is yes. There might be a motive uh, behind doing this attack, and it, it was not limited to the financials, and that's why the investigation is still going on. Okay, and then just a comment from Patrick. Uh, there is another SolarWinds CVE. Just released this re released this week, not related to the Trojan, but still impacting the security of systems using solar wind. It it is still going on. So thank you, thank you for bringing this up. I mean, uh, I wasn't able to wet it honestly to just put it in this presentation, uh, but yes, I'm very well aware of that particular CV that was released. And 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 again, you're going to see a lot of these updates coming in. It it, it is bound to happen. Uh, the research is still going on because. 
as I said, it's a chain attack. Think about hacking the major IT service provider from which everybody trusts. Okay, you have master access, admin access, pseudo access to whatever you need. And these are all like, all of these softwares are pretty intrusive and they all need major credentials or admin credentials. Like the one we talked about, Casilla, virtual system administrator. Yeah, I mean, of course it's productive, effective, less resources, but pros and cons. Yeah. So, uh, and then one uh, one other question uh, regarding the attackers. How big are the teams that participate? <laughs> Do we know? Hard to answer. No. <laughs> that's why. That's why. That's why it's um, uh, it's a very simple human concept, right? Uh, the fear of unknown, and then we try to name it. That's why we name these ransomware as a service gangs. There is no mention of how many people are acting. Who is acting? Is it state sponsored? Is it Russian military backed? Is it uh, Iran? Is it China? Don't know. But yeah, we have identified these actors. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a couple more questions, but I think you're gonna might be covering it later in your slides, so I'm gonna hold off on them. Awesome. And let me go if I'm going over time. Okay. So we just have three more slides to. Cover. Oh, you're good. Fine. Yeah. Okay. So mitigation and incident response. Now this is this is a slide super dear to me from the whole presentations because uh, very difficult to achieve and at the same time easy to do, right? Difficult to achieve if you are in an organization requires budget, uh, requires convincing, all of that stuff around how much revenue this is going to protect and security, especially always is is presented as insurance, which I personally don't prefer. Uh, so, yeah, and a uh, uh, few of the techniques like multi-factor authentication for remote access and IT networks. So simply enabling multi-factor authentication on your VPN client, uh, it's a major security upgrade. It's not that difficult. You can, if you're using Cisco, you can use Radius uh, to kind of uh, get into any known major IAM providers. Uh, facilities and do the multi and pop up the multi-factor authentication. Another way, which is not that secure, but it's still a two-factor authentication is to verify the certificates uh, after the login from the VPN uh, on the user machine, uh, do a posture check, all of those things. Enable a strong spam filter to prevent the phishing emails. Doable, but still tricky because I see every day a new type of hack or a phishing email that is being developed it's on the same concepts, same categorizations, but just up notch on what exactly that threat does. So, so you, you have to kind of understand, like this is, this is something you should do and always do, but it is not 100% secure unless you train your users, it's 50, 50. Uh, implement a strong user training program uh, for phishing attacks. Highly recommended, highly recommended. Uh, I just don't, personally, I just don't do this uh, as, a, as, a, as a professional, but like uh, also for the people I know on a day-to-day -day basis, elderly population, community events, I, I actually try to help people just to understand what exactly can happen if you are care, careless about fishing. And it's a, it's, a, it's a sad reality, but it is existing. So filter network tra traffic, uh, of course. So for the folks who have next generation firewalls, uh, good perimeter security, great. Use it as much as you can. Uh, now we have analytics that were provided to us, which is, which is pretty awesome. But if you don't create a simple firewall can also be used just by blacklisting known malicious IP address. Even your home router can be configured to do this. So. It's something you have to do, and I think that helps you do the primary protection, gives you a primary protection. Uh, most of the devices now come with blacklisting Tor IPs, known Tor IPs, so that is also pretty cool. Uh, and then update, update, update. Please update your systems, patch it, patch the devices. Uh, just last week, Netgear had three critical zero-day patches for the routers. so. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready to mention that in detail on what exactly those patches were, but now that we are working from home, now that we are reliant on a lot of public internet, 
make sure that our own systems are much more compliant or in a way uh, patched and with the latest updates. And and all of these companies let you know that the patches are available. So so let's not be uh, Kaseya that we didn't patch from 2015. Uh, and the best one is three and uh, protecting the data now, right? So if the ransomware is up to the data, then always do the three to one backup rule where always have an offsite backup, uh, two copies stored on the media devices and then copy three copies of the data. So use two separate media and then have three copies of the data. So always a thumb rule, uh, even on your personal level. So always back up a data in a uh, external hard drive or something or cloud if you prefer. Uh, some more points if you have a corporate organization and if you're trying to protect an organization, uh, need to know business access, uh, make sure that you put processes in place. Oh, sorry. You put processes in place where there is actually a approval method to provide a, uh, access to the RDP. So if your company is compliant with ISO or NIST standards, then the chances are that it is already doing it, uh, a verification using ticketing system or manual approval, but uh, put processes in place to limit it to need to know basis and then then audit it, vet it properly and, and restrict the RDP access because that has to be known as a, one of the most vulnerable con uh, components of the Windows environment right now, which can be exploited. Uh, again, uh, if you are using the next gen, next gen AV EDR solution uh, from CrowdStrike, Silas, Carbon Black, Semantic, anything, then yes, you are you are getting those updates and signatures daily uh, from them. But make sure that the user endpoints are up to date. So make sure that the signatures are up to date. Uh, one of the biggest challenges security individuals have been seeing and while talking to the network uh like my my own network it's it's uh very vpn dependent so sometimes it's not easy to push policies and uh maintain the clients on the machine and that's why you see still 27 2021 has a lot of attacks that are going on it's still not 100 percent secure but secu the, the industry is industry is getting up fast enough to make sure that we mitigate this risk by default. Uh, Windows and Microsoft products, of course, the biggest target, a dedicated uh, dedicated set of hackers are always uh, trying to exploit the Windows environment. And one of the things, and this is my philosophy behind the Windows environment is Windows and Microsoft is always ready to push a new product out rather than making it stable and secure like Apple does or other systems so not a bias but they are they are in a hurry to just roll out stuff as soon as possible like in in 2020 was a great business opportunity they rolled out microsoft teams everybody started using microsoft teams and then suddenly in a month we have a microsoft teams vulnerability remote execution so stuff like that so limit your microsoft i mean microsoft will try to give you so many fancy features try to limit as much as possible just go a little bit more analog uh, like disable the macro scripts it's easy i mean if you are a pro at using word great but if not then uh, just disable it by default and if you are using a corporate machine some of these things will be like disabled by default uh, monitor the tor connections as i mentioned earlier uh, if you have an extend firewall perimeter security seam solutions this will be easy to pick up but if you are not then it's something you should be aware about of the concept of what exactly Tor does. Um, and then um, incident response is pretty, pretty simple. I mean, there isn't much you can do. I mean, if, if there is a ransomware that has hit, uh, I would and I would always say just confirm that that's not the only system that has ransomware. So if and, and in, the input can be from anybody or directly yourself. Uh, try to power off the system immediately and, and then just make sure that that system is given to uh, any of your IT professionals, uh, service desk, uh, and end user engineering, all of those folks, they can connect to your security team, right? Uh, if you are a security personnel running a SOC team, make sure immediately when you get the information, the first step is to isolate the system from the network. 
uh, and then try to do sandboxing if possible. If you have backup software, if you can re-image the machine to a known good state, uh, re-image it and put it in a sandbox environment and try to obtain signatures, hash values, which can be used in doing a lot of uh, seam correlations and uh, antivirus signature updates to kind of A, identify and gauge how big is this incident and, and two is to uh, block it proactively. Uh, with that, I would say the last step would be if you don't have an in-house resource, hire a forensics firm. If you're running an organization, that's a given. Most of the cybersecurity insurances uh, provided by the uh, insurance providers do have that functionality. So if you don't know, try not to disrupt anything and just shut down the machine and go to some expert or hire an expert or consultant. Uh, but this is just for an industry. If you are at a personal level, if you don't have your backups, uh, it's again, it's it's a, it's it's a choice. You want to give your if you want to give cryptocurrency your money, that's the option to restore it. Otherwise, uh, reimage the machine. You might lose your data, but it's better than paying off the ransom. I would say, let's not make uh, obvious that yes, if you lock it, we are going to pay it. Uh, that should be all from me tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for listening to this. I know this was a lot of information, uh, a little bit confusing stats, but um, such is the subject as well when it comes to stats. Uh, I'm open to any questions you might have. Well, thank you. That was a lot of really good, uh, really good information. And we do have several questions. Uh, first one, uh, Patrick. Uh, he actually asked this a bit ago. I apologize for missing it. Uh, Ryuk, the more RYUK, uh, was that used against Scripps Health um, this past spring, or is that not yet known? Indicated, but not yet known for sure. Okay. Um, Lawrence, uh, is there data available that indicates how long an attacker spends inside a target system? Uh, sniffing around and doing whatever else uh, prior to executing a, the ransom attack? Uh, it all depends on what the company is trying to do, right? Here, not a lot is going on with the attacker. The attacker just locks your machine and then he's secure or she's secure at that point. The, the gang is secure, uh, which is which is the only point here. Then it depends on how you as an individual or your organization acts, right? Should the organization go and say, yes, we, I mean, it's the first 24 hours or the first 48 hours usually when uh, you have to give a commitment on exactly what is going to happen uh, are you going to pay the ransom or not uh, there is actually a good profession that came up in 2020 uh, which is called a ransomware negotiator where companies actually hire people who can negotiate the ransom uh, the like the one i mentioned in Casia, right 70 million dollars is the ask probably it will come down to four or $5 million if the company is willing to pay for it. But yes, that's usually the timeline depends on how you are acting as a company. Should you say not gonna do it, then 48 hours later, you'll see the impact. Um, are you aware of any ransomware attacks affecting iOS or um, iPad devices? Not yet. There were, there were some initial Mac-based attacks but those were those were more malwares. They were not like major scale ransomware that was hitting an organization. No. Okay. Um, this is more of an opinion question. Uh, do you think companies should be financially responsible if their failure to patch a known vulnerability causes damage to someone else? Um, personal opinion. I do not represent my employer in any way. For capacity. <laughs> good, good disclaimer. <laughs> uh i i think depends upon what data are we talking about uh seriously if if uh i i, I say governments should be more responsible and 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 so would be the big corporations which have stakeholders and shareholders uh negligence represents how much value they are providing to the stakeholders in a way. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring the subject around California DMV being hacked two times in the last two years. Leaked data. Uh, all they said was, sorry, 
we'll try to do our best. It was our contractor, it wasn't us. So if it was any private company, they would be subjected to CCPA with major fines, lawsuits, uh, credit report tracking, all of that stuff. So I think it's an equal responsibility, equal, equal share. Um, how much additional IT spending in percent uh, for companies to implement protection against randomware? I know it's going to vary, but in general. Uh, I mean, depending upon how much your revenue is and how much information you have. Uh, right now, I think with the, with the advent of cloud infrastructure, uh, companies like AWS, Microsoft are giving a lot of uh, out of the box security solution, which provides you a robust monitoring, uh, very uh, inexpensive way to create correlation queries and monitor stuff. Uh, so I'm I'm not giving you an amount or a number behind that because that's tricky. I mean, uh, if you don't want to go to big budget security companies, then there is a lot of things you can do just from the grounds up to manage your ransomware. Security education being one of them making sure your firewall rules are uh, audited every quarter. Those, those are primary things. And if you go back to our presentation, the last two hacks were done on the IT service providers. So you, you don't want to really start spearheading the investment discussion without doing an evaluation of your own environment. Right. Um, do you know how long ago did Microsoft Teams have a remote execution vulnerability? There were two, if I'm not wrong. The, the first one was uh, in April, April or May 2020. That's that's what I remember because I was all hyped up about it myself as soon as I heard about it because that was a uh, it was pretty new to me. But yes, that was one, and then it was late in Thanksgiving time. But Microsoft patched it like in in no time, I would say. Okay. Uh, back on slide 17, you mentioned an OT network. What is an OT network? So, uh, internal network and uh, external network here. Okay. Yeah. Um, regarding the 321 backup model, uh, do you mm -hmm. recommend making a gold copy that is uh, read only? Always, always. Oh. Uh, make sure you do that. Again, uh, it, the biggest thing you have to remember about security is not to lock yourself in a room and then lost the key. So. Super common sense, but yes, it's always a advisable thing to have a read-only golden copy. Keep it in a safe, <laughs> and and make make a routine to update it every month if you can. All right. Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, one is that we've had more Zoom bombers than uh, Microsoft Team bombers. <laughs> yes. Uh, sure. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's always a, a frightening one. And uh, the other one is just to say thank you because uh, there are some uh, interesting and frightening stats, and I agree. I appreciate it. No, um, actually, this this is exactly what, uh, as I said right when in the beginning, it's a subject which is easy to understand but scary. It's very technical. At the same time, it's not. So, I I tried my best to keep it neutral because it's easy to dive into forensics. It's easy to dive into what exactly needs to be done in 15 minutes and everybody will be sleeping. But yes, this is, this is, uh, thank you. I appreciate your patience and time, everyone. Uh, hey, I appreciate your pay, your time in, in putting this together. It was extremely interesting and uh, uh, we really appreciate it. And judging hey, Dan, I had a question, if I may. This is Momin. Oh, okay, Momin. Sorry, I, I uh, drew a great talk. Appreciate uh, you putting it together. Um, I kind of uh, joined late, so I uh, I wanted to ask you a question. I might have missed it. You may already have covered it. Uh, no worries. So my question is that can you explain the mechanics of the uh, ransomware attack where 
what exactly is happening? They're going into your system and locking up your uh, information so you can't access it? Or how is that mechanics for? Uh, let me let me share it again. I mean, it's it's type two types, right? I mean, it's it all starts with a hacker having a remote access to your machine and being undetected, right? So the attempt is always it's it's a lot of behavior and technical thing together. So the hacker always tries to stay behind the scene, not doing any process spike, not doing any memory manipulations, nothing. They they observe the behavior of a user for a long time. Uh, there are two types of ransomware, and, and let me share my screen again. Sorry, Darren, I'm gonna go back. Go for it. Yeah. Share. There are two types of ransomware, crypto and locker, right? So the rule number one is a hacker needs to have access to your remote access to your machine, right? It can be done through Trojan, backdoor, I mean, different types of Trojans and different methods, phishing. Uh, so once you have the access to the system, right? Uh, the type of ransomware, which is called crypto ransomware, only focuses on the file which has been monitored and deemed to be important. And those files are encrypted. So this was this was mostly seen in the days when backup and business continuity disaster recovery, um, geolocation, separate geolocation zones was not a thing. Out of 100 chances were 50% 50, 50 would have no idea where the files are from a backup perspective. So that's when this particular category was used. All the new and the post 2016, 17 ransomwares that are being observed are called locker, which means when the time comes, right? And this is much more quicker. So this doesn't require a period for monitoring. When the time comes, this particular ransomware is deployed as a zero day vulnerability or any other way and encrypt the entire machine, rendering it to be unusable. Even the boot memory, uh, re-imaging capacity, everything is stopped. So at that point, your machine is nothing. It's just a dead machine. So hope that answers. And I can give you a couple of examples. For example, that would be uh, the first one, right? Patia. Patia, you can see back in uh, 2018 and 2020, types of Patia, more, more advanced Patias were used to kind of render the infrastructure and the business machines incapable. So they, they actually overwrite your master boot record, making system unbootable. So that that, that tough. Okay. Uh, I have one follow-on question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Now, nowadays, including my organization, we are going to cloud um, saving, you know, they're using cloud storage. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the probability of the cloud data uh, being a victim of ransomware? Um, it's, it falls between high and medium. It's not completely gone just because your data is in the cloud. Because every cloud company, AWS, being the main one, uh, works on a shared security responsibility model. So they give you out of the box controls on their infrastructure, they protect their infrastructure, and then all the infrastructure that is part of your endowment as a private cloud or a public cloud, uh, you are responsible to enforce those security controls. So data can be leaked. I mean, we have examples like Expedian was one of the examples, right? data got leaked the only only variable in this case would be the data would be locked up in ransomware now a good thing about cloud environment and if you are doing it in the right way or if it's architected in the right way right there is always a dr site in a different zone there are multiple availability zones so it's it's a, it's a huge benefit for companies who can afford to have uh, geographically distributed data and, and backups, and then keep testing the DR sites. So that that's the only way you can protect yourself and recover the 
recover from ransomware without worrying over anything else. But yes, there's a high high to medium probability that yes, you will be hit by a ransomware on your cloud infrastructure. And this is just considering your your complete infrastructure being backed up in multiple environments. Hope that hope that helps. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. And one other another question came in. Uh, just checking. Did you recommend updating the remote uh, backup once a month? Yes. Um, I, that was in the context of of having a read only backup, uh, as I as I recall. Correct. Yes. I mean, I I would say the read only backup or whatever your golden copy is, right? Your golden backup. Right. Try to make it a habit to do it monthly if you are super busy. Otherwise, fortnight is my recommendation where you can do every 15 days, every two weekends, check to see what is going on and just store it on your. Uh, and again, I mean, there, there aren't much. If you are using cloud services where you are storing data on the cloud, you can do the same thing on cloud. Uh, at the same time, can have a hard drive. I'm a big fan of hard drive, so I, I store it in hard drive. Uh, I believe that is all the questions that have come in. So, uh, other than a couple of people saying thank you, and I would like to say thank you as well. Like I say, a very interesting talk. Really appreciate it. So, um, thanks a lot. Absolutely. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you, everybody who made tonight just to discuss this subject. Thanks. And uh, as, as I mentioned, the uh, recording and uh, the slides uh, that Triv's going to send me. Uh, we'll be uh, uh, up on our website in the next uh, day or two. Give me a day or two. <laughs> and um, uh, I'll send out a link to everybody who registered tonight. Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a nice evening.